Welcome back, everybody, in the aula. I hope you enjoyed your lunch break with that great weather outside, and I hope you're having two insightful days here in St. Gallen. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear how you're count with, the five, with, with meeting five leaders from a different generation each day is, is going, so excited on that. And now I'm happy to announce the next session, which is um, a very special session for the format of the Sangalen Symposium, namely our Max schmidt heine session. The great attack on the sovereignty and freedom of Ukraine by the Russian Federation in February 2022 wasn't just a gross violation of international law, it was a now provable, certifiable war crime. As we stand here this afternoon, courageous Ukrainians are continuing to defend the integrity of their homeland and the integrity of their civilization. The Russian president not only intended to take apart the very roots of this country to deny its history, to take apart its cities, to rename its cities, to take away its voice. And you know that voice is a fundamental principle of our new generational contract. The Russian president wanted to silence the voice of Ukraine. Since its interception, inception, the schmidt heine lecture has stood against these forces in the world. Last year, my former CNN colleague, Maria Ressa, who is an absolute force of nature despite her small stature, fighting for press freedom, fighting for voice in her native Philippines, but on and against dictatorship around the world, reminded us just how vital raising your voice, continuing to have open conversations, to speak truth to power, and to not let the regular rest to push and push again she reminded us of those points in her schmidt heine lecture last year, right from this very stage. And voice is also one of our seven principles of the new generational contract. So we are thrilled, not only Leo and I, but I think many of you in the audience, to hear from Nobel laureate Alexandra Matvichuk in conversation with my friend and yours, Ali Aslan. She is a lawyer by training, but of course she is one of the most prominent voices fighting for civil liberties and civil rights in her country. She grew to national prominence. Many of you may have seen her back then when she spearheaded the Euromaidan SOS uh, initiative to help those persecuted after protesting so vividly for their freedoms for political change as part of the Euromaidan movement. And in 2021, Matvichuk was nominated to the United Nations Committee Against Torture and made history as Ukraine's first female candidate to the UN Treaty body. She ran on a platform to limit violence against women in conflict. She's a tireless advocate for the rights of humans, for the rights of individuals, but of course also for the rights of her people. And I've had the great pleasure to listen to her a number of times and now soon this pleasure will be our joint. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Ali Aslan, who will host her, and Oleksandra Matvichuk. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine, for this very kind introduction. It's lovely to be back here in the second year in a row. And last year, I was on the stage and had the pleasure of moderating a very vital panel on the future of NATO, of course, spurred the discussion, spurred uh, by the Russian attack on Ukraine. And today is no exception. Delighted, Alexandra Matvichuk, to have you here with us. Uh, it's already been pointed out your profile has been raised uh, by, by uh, quite a fault after receiving, very well deservingly receiving the Nobel Peace Prize 
in 2022 for your arduous work and something I think we can acknowledge once again with a round of applause. Uh, this is... Alexandra, be before we get into uh, the judicial details uh, of your work, uh, uh, let, let's, let's uh, start on a more personal uh, premise. You have, of course, uh, started working for the Center for Liber Civil Liberties ever since it was established in 2007. How did you get initially involved in the work of the center? It's my understanding you actually, your primary aim was to be a theater director. Yes, it's true. When I was uh, in school, I have a dream to become a theater director and to organize performances. And maybe uh, if I uh, was born in Switzerland, I will choose this uh, part uh, of um, society work. But I was born in Ukraine and uh, we have no luxury to take for granted democracy, security and freedom. And uh, we have fight for these values all this time, especially now during the large scale invasion. So I think that the mine life changing moment was in school when I got acquaintance with Ukrainian dissidents. It's intellectuals who fighting during Soviet Union for their rights to express their point of view for human dignity, for freedom, and for democracy. And they were subjected to different kinds of persecutions. A lot of them died in Soviet Hulag camps. Some of them were forcibly treated in psychological hospitals. A lot of them lost their career and possibility to development. And when, as a young girl, I met these people, I was inspired by example, because I saw the people who say what they think and do what they say. I saw the people who have enough bravery to fight against the whole totalitarian Soviet machine, who has no other instruments, just only their words and their own position and they convincingly prove that the words and your own position is a very essential tool. I think it's needless to say your life has been turned upside down twice. Once, obviously, uh, in February uh, uh, last year when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and when you received the Nobel Peace Prize uh, uh, as well. Uh, guide us through, talk us through. Uh, how did you experience uh, the, the, the first few days of the Russian invasion as a human rights defender and lawyer? I decided to stay in Kiev. And it was a very tough decision because the future is not guaranteed and we don't know whether or not we will see Russian troops in the streets of my city. And I have been documenting war crimes since this war started from 2014. So I know for sure what Russians do with active people in occupied territories. Because I personally interviewed hundreds of people who survived Russian captivity. And they told me horrible stories. They told me how they were beaten, raped, how their fingers were cut, how they were smashed into wooden boxes, how they were tortured with electricity, their nails will turn away, their nails were drilled. One woman told me how her eye were dug out with a spoon. So it's horrible stories. And that is why it was a tough decision. But it's my city, it's my people, it's my country. And I think that this is something which Putin don't underestimate in Ukrainian people that when you're fighting for your freedom and your dignity, you're much more powerful than even the second army in the world. You decided uh, to stay in Kiev, as you pointed out, not an easy decision. <laughs> yes. to stay uh, at the forefront uh, to help people. Uh, and, and of course, uh, 
we as Western consumers, quote unquote, we hear the tales of Butcher and Izum, the mass graves, uh, who may be just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, what sort of crimes is the Western public not aware of? It's very hard to express the experience when you are in full-scale invasion. I, I still lack of words to express it because it's not a norma. The war is not a norma. Maybe I will try to, to express it with one quote. This is a quote of a woman who lost all her family when Russian rocket hit your building. And this quote showed that death is horrible, but long painful deaths of your relatives, which you witness and you can do nothing, it's a hell. She told us that she heard how her family dying, that first her husband tried to push something heavy. He heard that he attempted to push something heavy, and then he became silent. Then your daughter started crying and also became silent. Your son several times called her as mother and also became silent. And what, why I say that my life's completely changed? Because after a large-scale invasion, we faced with so enormous human pain that even me, with all my experience, knowledge of international law, uh, working in human rights field and documenting war crimes for years, I wasn't unprepared. I, I was unprepared because it's something unhuman. And it's still difficult for me to take this as a norma. I think it's very evident uh, and natural and completely understanding the toll it takes on you uh, as a human being, as a human rights defender uh, and lawyer. Where do you take the strength to get up every day and uh, try to document these atrocities and war crimes, which naturally each and every one of us I would be very much psychologically burdened by that. Maybe I will mention two things. And first, for sure, I will start with that people inspiring me. When large-scale invasion started, international organization evacuated their personnel. But ordinary people remained. And ordinary people started to do extraordinary things. They took people out from the ruined cities. They broke encirclement to provide humanitarian aid. They helped to survive under artillery fires. They risked their lives, literally sacrificed their lives to save others whom they never met before. My friend lost her husband when he organized evacuation from one city which was sieged by Russia. She was hit with something heavy and she told that they have to put the remainings of his body in one bag because there is even no body. And he didn't know these people before. He just understand that as a human being, he couldn't be indifferent. He has to do something. And that is why I will talk to another Part, uh, it will be responsibility. We feel a huge responsibility, not only for democratic development of our country, but also we have a huge responsibility to prevent the possible Russian attack to next nations. Because all this hell which we now face in Ukraine is a result of total impunity which Russia enjoyed for decades in Chechnya, in Moldova, in Georgia, in Mali, in Syria, in Libya, in other countries of the world. They have never been punished. They believe they can do whatever they want. And that is why we must break the circle of impunity. We must demonstrate justice.
And there are, of course, steps uh, being taken by the international community and international organizations to do away with the impunity, to hold those responsible uh, to account. The International Criminal Court open investigations into war crimes in Ukraine, but of course, it can go after individuals, but doesn't have the authority to arrest suspects on its own. It relies very much on its 123 members. Uh, the International Court of Justice has also launched proceedings against Russia, but has no jurisdictions to try individuals. It's basically a civil court that hears disputes between countries. So the question is, of course, on everyone's mind, something that you have pleaded for, something that President Zelensky has, has demonstrated and voiced uh, in his recent uh, visit to the Netherlands, is you know, how to hold Vladimir Putin accountable. There is an arrest warrant for him out there, but how realistic is it really that we will have the special tribunal to try him and those responsible that you have called for uh, f f since the beginning of the war? I believe that our future is depending on our current action. And in order to achieve justice for Ukraine and for other nations in the world, we have to change the global approach to war crime justice. We have to fill accountability gap which we face. First, we have to create a special tribunal on aggression now and hold Putin, Lukashenko, and top political leadership and senior military command of Russian state accountable. Because all this crime which we're now documenting is the result of their leadership decision to initiate, to plan, and to start this war of aggression. And in order to do it, we have to stop to look to the world through the prism of Nuremberg trials, where Nazi war criminals were tried, but after Nazi regime had collapsed. We live in a new century. Justice must be independent of the magnitude of Putin's regime's power. We cannot wait how the war will end. We have to establish such tribunal now. And second, I work directly with people who survived hell. And I know that they need to restore not just their broken lives. They need to restore their broken belief that rule of law is essential, injustice is possible, even though delayed in time. And we have now a lot of tools to make it happen, because when I use this example of Balkans war, and photo which was made 30 years ago. The last year investigation of journalists on this photo where one Serbian military kicked three dead people who laid on the ground with a pool of blood, they identified this person. After 30 years, using just digital instrument and open data, they were able to do it, even not being on the spot. So it's possible with the new technologies to identify perpetrators, to restore what happens, to document war crimes, and to return people their names. Because wars turned people into the numbers. But people are not numbers. The life of each person matters. I think the uh, international tribunal that you're calling for um, Let's talk how realistic you, you see the path towards it. Because in this part of the world, yes, you're enjoying a great deal of solidarity in Ukraine. But we're, if we're looking at the global scale, China, uh, India, you know, perhaps even Indonesia, South Africa, Brazil, these are countries that are not yet quite firmly in the uh, Ukrainian camp, some quite on the contrary, as in the case of Beijing. How do we bring those on board? We have a lot of countries which experience their own problem going through their very horrible uh, crisis or wars or are far from the context. But when we speak about justice, we speak about universal value. And if there is a universal value, it has to be a universal service. And Ukraine can be a first precedent how to make it happen. And what I want to emphasize that we speak not just about war between two states. This is a war 
between two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. And Putin started this war not in February 2022, but in February 2014, when Ukraine obtained a chance for the quick democratic transition after collapse of authoritarian regime due to revolution of dignity. And in order to stop us on this way, Russia occupied Crimea, part of Lugansk and Donetsk region, and last year expanded this war to the large-scale invasion. And that is why this war has a very vivid value dimension. They put a very practical question. How we people who live in the 21st century will protect a human being? Can we rely upon on the law? Or no, even in the 21st century, we have to rely upon only to the weapons. And this is not just a Ukrainian problem. This is a question to the whole world, because Ukraine is a vivid example that the entire UN system couldn't stop Russian atrocities. When I spoke with my friends from Africa, they told that for years people don't pay a lot of attention to the very important issues that are going on in this region. And I answered, I feel your pain. Because for eight years, we were in the same situation. I sent numerous reports about tortures and deaths in occupied territories to all existing international organizations. Nobody cared. But the situation is even worse. When we get this attention, when the whole world are focused on Ukraine, we can do nothing to stop these atrocities and Today, I started my morning with a check-in. Whether or not I still have a flat to return, or a Russian rocket hit my building. What happened with my family when I was there in this beautiful city? Are they still alive or not? So this means that it's not a Ukrainian problem. We speak about global problem, about our common security, which were taken for granted for too long. You have uh, devoted uh, your entire professional life to uphold human rights. You've become a lawyer to do exactly that, uh, to stand and protect uh, by those uh, who need the law the most. The impunity that you've talked about, uh, is it hard to resist cynicism, becoming bitter at times when you see that, yes, some authoritarians do get away with uh, such crimes. What do you, is it hard to draw upon the belief? When you can't rely, rely upon a legal instrument or on responsible political decisions, you can always rely upon on people. And I would like to use this moment to express my sincere gratitude to all of you and all people in Switzerland and other countries who support Ukraine in this dramatic time of our history. It's very important to know that we are not alone in this civilizational battle. We are very grateful. And I think that we can do more. When large-scale invasion started, the civilized world say, let's help Ukraine not to fail. And we started to obtain the first weapons and first economic sanctions was imposed against Russia. But it's time to switch to another narratives. Let's help Ukraine to win fast. This is a huge difference between let's help Ukraine not to fail and let's help Ukraine to win. And the democratic world needs success of Ukraine. Because only success of Ukraine and failure of Russia will open a chance for democratic future of Russia itself. And that is why when I ask my colleague, Russian human rights defenders, how I can help them in these difficult circumstances when they are prosecuted, labeled as foreign agent, jailed and killed, they always answered, if you want to help us, please, be successful. 
and be successful, the success and the victory of Ukraine that you and your president have uh, promoted and believed in since the outbreak of the war. Currently, of course, we're discussing the possibility of a Ukrainian counteroffensive. Uh, I know you're not a military expert per, per se, but reading the mood also in your country, how do you see the prospects of potential gains being made in the coming weeks and, uh, and months? And what, what support does Ukraine need at this particular juncture in time? A lot of has to be done. I know that when people listen to the news that next tranche was uh, adopted or next package of sanction was imposed, sometimes you can have the impression that Ukraine gets everything which we need. But it's not true. For the whole last year, we didn't receive any modern tank. We still have no modern plane. And it's very difficult to close the sky and secure peaceful cities and civilians under Russian rockets without such kind of weapons. Yes, it's strange to hear from human rights defenders that we need weapons, but it's true. Democracy has to defend itself. And I do believe that it's a temporary solution, that we will be able to restore justice and restore international order, and in future, other People, my successor, will be there and they will tell that they can rely upon on the law. This year's, yes, please. We are, of course, at a university here and uh, this year's St. Gallen Symposium focuses in particular on cross-generational dialogue and the next uh, generation. Uh, what has been the war's impact on the youth of Ukraine and what do you think needs to happen to, to support them going forward? I think that for Ukrainians and for other nations, this tragedy is a huge de demonstration that freedom and human rights, it's not something which you obtain once and forever that every day we are fighting and we are making decision in favor of human rights or in favor of authoritarianism. Because even in well-developed democracies, we see that new generation, they started to perceive freedom and human rights for granted because they inherited this system from their parents. They don't know their real meaning and that is why sometimes they very easily exchange freedom for illusion of safety, for economical benefits, or for their own comfort. And example of Ukraine is convincingly proof that in such period, we have to step from the, our zone of comfort. There are a lot of things which we perceived as important in the peaceful times. But when we're in time of crisis, we understand that only a few of them really matters. Alexandra, we're almost out of time. I, I think without optimism, a sense of optimism, you wouldn't be able to do your job. Uh, how optimistic are you that we're going to see, a, hopefully, very soon end uh, to this war, and of course, an end that suits uh, your vision as a human rights defender in Ukraine. You can't be optimist and work in human rights field in our part of the world for so long. So yes, <laughs> I have an optimist perception because I believe in people. And I know that people have a much more power than they even imagine. And the mobilization, mass mobilization of ordinary people in different countries of the world can change the world history much quicker than the UN intervention. I think it goes without saying that, uh, and I think I speak for all here in the audience who've had the privilege and pleasure of listening to you for the past 30 minutes. We all admire your uh, persistence, your courage uh, on a daily basis that you displayed for which you were deservingly recognized by the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. Uh, when are you heading back to Kiev? I will have several visits um, and then I will uh, return because 
There is no functioning airport current moment in Ukraine, and that is why I spent two days just to get out from the country. And when you spend out two days, you try to put everything next to each other. I think uh, to listen to the head of the Kiev-based nonprofit organization Center for Civil Liberties and the Nobel Peace Prize laureates uh, of last year, we wish you nothing but the best. May this war end very soon. And to you, uh, best of luck. Keep up the good fight and best of luck. Alexandra Thank you. Machivo, ladies and gentlemen. Wow, that was really touching. And uh, we really, Alexandra, we really admire your strength and you really moved our participants here. And thank you for that. Now, before we transition to our next high-level panel,